Okay, we are, we, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the second lunchtime uh, with the aquarium. Uh, last week it was lunchtime at the aquarium and uh, I was physically there with Barrett Christie, our director of animal husbandry. Uh, but uh, in the spirit of um, self-quarantine and social distancing, we are running today's uh, webinar from our respective homes. And so it is lunchtime with the aquarium. Uh, today is going to be all about education and uh, learning about learning. Um, but I will start with a lesson in English before we get into a lesson of uh, uh, of science. Uh, and being an English major myself, uh, lunchtime at Aquarium last week is a little bit different than lunchtime with the Aquarium this week. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jason Patlas. I'm the President and CEO of the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk. With me this afternoon is Tom Naiman, who is uh, our Director of Education. Uh, Tom has been with the Maritime Aquarium for five years. I've been with the Maritime Aquarium for all of five months. Uh, but Tom and I share a couple of interesting uh, pedigrees. Uh, right before coming to the Maritime Aquarium, Tom worked at uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, as did I. And for those of you who know the Bronx Zoo and the Central Park Zoo and the New York Aquarium, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society runs those institutions. They're also the largest conservation organization in the world, working in 60 countries around the world. And so um, it gives me a lot of gratitude to know that uh, the largest and most respected conservation organization in the world serves as a feeder institution for the Maritime Aquarium just, uh, just up the coast in, uh, in Norwalk. And uh, that just underscores the, uh, the talent and the expertise that we have on staff uh, at the Maritime Aquarium. Tom and I also share another pedigree, and that is that we're both born and bred New Yorkers, and yet we both love nature. And um, we found our love of nature through slightly different avenues. Tom going to the Bronx Zoo and Central Park Zoo and enjoying uh, the facilities of WCS. I uh, came to love nature, spending time at the beach, on the shore, in the mountains, in the forests. And, um, and once again, the Maritime Aquarium really um, underscores the connection between both of those avenues, uh, because you will hear over the next 45 minutes um, about our facilities and our programs in-house, and you'll also hear about the wonderful education programs that we, uh, that we have outside of the aquarium, on the water and along the shoreline. A uh, couple of rules and uh, housekeeping notes before we get going. Uh, the first is that um, this is not just a conversation between Tom and myself. This is a conversation with all of you. We've got about 110, 115 registered for uh, this webinar. So welcome again to all of you. Uh, I hope you are staying safe and healthy and remaining optimistic and in good spirits through these challenging times. Uh, but for the next 45 minutes, if you guys have questions, uh, please use the chat function. Uh, and you will see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, click on chat, type in your question. The question will go only to the panelists, uh, Tom and me and some of the staff at the Maritime Aquarium. And then uh, I'll incorporate uh, that question into the conversation. Um, it is not, uh, if you come online you for a question, you will not be uh, videoed, but we are taping this so that we could post it uh, on Facebook and our website uh, for those who are not able to join us this afternoon. So I think with that, uh, Tom, let me ask if I've missed any other housekeeping notes. And if not, uh, I've got a, an opening in, I've got an opening comment for you and then turn it over to you for a few minutes. Well, no, I think, I think you've covered everything and um, I just wanna add my welcome. I know that everybody has a lot on their minds and on their plates. Uh, hopefully, uh, they're having lunch with us. Um, and it's just a pleasure to spend some time with you this afternoon. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. So, so let me begin by saying uh, you guys are all looking at uh, a video of uh, Lunchtime with the Sharks. Uh, we featured them last week, and you can see them here uh, joining us for lunch uh, on video. But many of... Um, Many of uh, the people in the community in the region know us for what we have in-house. They know us for the exhibits, they know us for the sharks, the seals, the jellies, 
um, 500,000 people or thereabouts come and visit us each year. But what many do not know is that our education programs are every bit as important to the exhibits. And we serve about 80,000 students and children through our education programs. So let's step back in time for a moment, Tom, before COVID-19, before the world turned upside down. And give me a sense of what the education portfolio looks like uh, for the Maritime Aquarium. Sure, Jason, happy to do that. I brought some photos to, um, to uh, show while we do that. Um, a lot of people don't know the extent of what we do. Um, our mission at the aquarium, of course, is to uh, inspire people to appreciate and protect Long Island Sound and the global environment. And we start with our facilities at the aquarium. Uh, the education for our 500,000 or so visitors starts with our exhibits, um, starts with our signage, but we also in the education department do all sorts of things on the aquarium floor to engage and inspire and educate our visitors. Uh, we hold talks in front of our exhibits. We do live animal encounters on our Sea Star stage. We have a uh, phenomenal a uh, group of more than 300 volunteers from age 15 to 95 who spend 28,000 hours a year with us engaging with our visitors. And by the way, this afternoon we have a live uh, panel with volunteers at four o'clock called Meet the Gallery Ambassadors. And if anyone in our audience is interested, uh, please go to our website and register for that. So the education and inspiration that we provide to aquarium visitors is very, very important to us. In addition to that, uh, many people may know that we have an incredibly innovative hybrid electric vessel. And we're one of the few uh, aquariums or zoos in the country that literally has the ability to take people into the incredible ecosystem that we focus on so that they can learn about uh, the life of Long Island Sound, what's happening on the water, what's happening under the water. And uh, it's really an important part of what we do. And we have the most extensive um, series or suite of on the water education programs of any aquarium in the country. And we're very proud of that. Um, we have an extensive school program. We have five classrooms at the aquarium and virtually every day of the school year. Uh, those classrooms are full with all sorts of programs from uh, pre-kindergarten through high school and even college programs. Uh, we are a founding partner in the Maritime Odyssey Preschool, which is located a mile from the aquarium. It's a STEM-oriented, marine-themed preschool that's now the largest preschool in Norwalk. And then for um, the schools that might not be able to visit us uh, all the time, we have a fleet of vehicles that allow us to do a subset of our programs in the schools. So uh, through our traveling teacher program, we take programs, we take animals to the schools, and we do programs there. Hey, so Tom, let me, uh, let me interrupt before you turn the slide. So I'm looking at that uh, Honda Accord. It's a hybrid vehicle so that with uh, clean energy, uh, at least uh, with hybrid technology. Uh, I'm looking at a wrap of rays. Give me the species that are on all of our cars. <laughs> well, you're looking at cow-nosed rays there, which are uh, denizens of our shark and ray touch tank. Um, we have a shark car with sand tiger sharks. We have a jelly car that's covered with moon jellies, and we have a turtle car, which is covered with green sea turtles, all species that can be found in the aquarium. And, uh, you know, we have to be extra careful uh, driving around in these cars because we are readily identifiable. So if anyone, uh, you know, cheats on a stop sign, everybody will know. Yeah, I, I'd be hard pressed to think that no police is going to want to uh... Uh, arrest somebody from, from the <laughs> aquarium. But uh, breaking the law is breaking the law. Um, I asked because I wanted to work in the first question that we have on our shark species. And um, 
Tom, you already mentioned, we've got sand tiger sharks, which are native to Long Island Sound. Uh, we've got six of those in our large open water tank, uh, which, is, uh, which was the opening video that you saw. Uh, we've got additionally a lemon shark um, in, uh, in that tank, and, and those are our large sharks at the Maritime Aquarium. Back to you, Tom. Okay, great. Um, in addition to our school programs, our citizen science programs are extremely important to us. Uh, these are opportunities for us to engage the public in the important science and conservation work that we do around the region. The big photo you see here is part of our horseshoe crab tagging sessions. We're a member of something called Project Limulus that focuses on horseshoe crab research and conservation. We go out several times a year uh, around the full moon, so it can be quite late at night, and we have uh, members of our community join us at Calf Pasture Beach in Norwalk to tag horseshoe crabs. We're also part of a national program called Frog Watch. We have a cooperative chapter with Beardsley Zoo and the Peabody Museum in New Haven. And our uh, most immediate uh, citizen science opportunity is the City Nature Challenge, which is a global effort. And we have been running the Fairfield County and Westchester chapter. And that actually occurs this Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And you can go to our website and find out how to join. We've made some changes so people can um, use various tools to identify uh, animals they may find in and around their homes because obviously we want to encourage uh, uh, observations of nature while also uh, supporting social distancing. Okay, thanks. Um, we also have a, a variety of camp programs, vacation camps, summer camps, a very active program uh, that involves a lot of the highlights of the other things I've mentioned. Campers go to Pet Calf Pasture Beach uh, to do seining. They go out on our vessel and learn to uh, understand and explore the waters of Long Island Sound. Um, so it's a really um, vigorous and varied program uh, from uh, early childhood through, um, through high school years. So Tom, let me ask a couple of questions. Give me a sense of the demographics of the kids that are participating in these programs, both during the year and over the summer. Well, it's incredibly varied. And I'm glad you asked because it's important to note that um, somewhere, between, somewhere around 40% of students who come to the Maritime Aquarium uh, receive subsidized admission or subsidized participation in our programs. Um, we have uh, a lot of scholarships for our summer camp. We have had for many years now a cooperative program with the mayor's office and with Norwalk Public Schools that allows 50 middle school students to come for a week of STEM oriented summer camp at no charge. It's called the Mayor's Summer Program in Science and Engineering. And um, every Norwalk school group gets free admission to the aquarium and we provide subsidies to other school groups from throughout the region. So um, rarely if ever is cost or price a barrier um, to coming to the aquarium or participating. The three areas, three places we draw from most often are um, Norwalk, Stanford, and Bridgeport. And of course, those are uh, very diverse communities uh, with very high needs populations. And uh, we're thrilled to be able to have um, uh, uh, people of all ages and most importantly, students from those communities. Um, it's not all that uncommon that we have a student come out on the vessel with us who's never been on a boat before. And uh, that's, it's really exciting to be able to make that. I, awesome. I would say it's more than, uh, it's more than the occasional student. My, um, you know, I mentioned I started five months ago uh, at, the, uh, at the aquarium. Uh, it was just at the tail end of the, um, of the programming using uh, our uh, floating classroom, the spirit of the sound. And, uh, and so I went on with a couple different school groups. And um, you, one of your educators, Tom, asked the kids, uh, it was an eighth grade class, 
How many of them had never been on a boat before? And a, a good third of the kids, this was uh, out of a school near Hartford, a good third of the kids has raised their hands never having been on a boat before. This was their first time uh, being on, on a vessel on the Sound. It was, uh, for me, my first time on the boat myself. Now, that was a very telling moment for just how impactful these programs are for the kids. Yeah, and you know, it, it's so exciting to be able to teach people about this amazing ecosystem, as I said, in their, in their backyard. Um, most people don't uh, know um, what a, what a spectacular and special and important place Long Island Sound is. And to be able to take people out into the sound is, is just incredibly exciting. So I'm going to say, Tom, uh, there's a comment uh, that we got um, on this very issue, taking people out on the sound, taking kids out on the sound. And given that they're, we're all um, quarantined at home, we're all social distancing, you know, there's so many images around the world of streets in major urban centers that are completely empty. Uh, there's a question from one of our, um, from one of our audience about whether we could go out on the sound and show how quiet it is, how peaceful it is. We see how clean the canals in Venice are. Can we see any kind of visible change on the sound now, given that nobody's out there? You know, that is a great question. And I'm not sure, uh... If, any's, but if anybody has looked at that, I mean, I think it's certainly safe to assume that uh, the waters of the sound are a lot quieter. Um, there's been a lot of research on marine noise and the impact on wildlife. Uh, so I'm certain that uh, the waters are a, are a lot quieter. Um, I do know that um, a couple of our captains took our vessel down to Mamaroneck uh, to a boatyard there for some maintenance. And uh, it, it'd be interesting to check with them. I would bet that the sound is a lot quieter than they've ever seen it. Uh, so Tom, I wanna ask um, a little bit about, you mentioned STEM. Uh, yeah. Let's, um, for folks who may or may not know, tell me what STEM is and tell me the importance of STEM education. Well, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And, um, it's a term that has become very important in educational circles over the last 20 years or so. Um, there was a recognition uh, starting around that time that the United States was falling behind in terms of these fields, again, science, technology, engineering, and math, and that um, we were gonna be, um, our, our competitiveness uh, as a nation uh, was potentially gonna suffer because more and more science, technology, engineering, and math are a part of um, the expertise that's needed um, to compete in the workplace, to compete in the global marketplace. Um, as I mentioned, our mission uh, involves conservation. Um, you and I having worked at conservation organizations in addition to the aquarium, or as well as the aquarium, know that the conservation becomes more and more um, science-based, uh, more and more technology-based. And uh, so it is well within our mission as an institution, but also within our uh, responsibility to the community to be helping teachers and parents um, prepare their students and their children for success uh, in their community and in their lives. And STEM education is key to that. And you don't have to look far now to see uh, the importance. Um, understanding this virus that we're all facing is based on science. The models uh, that we're all looking at are math and science-based models. We're hearing about technology being converted from other purposes to creating things like ventilators. Um, and. Uh, and we're seeing teachers and students having to rapidly become more uh, technology adept as they move to an online learning environment. So uh, STEM is key to what we do and to our community and to the nation. And um, you see here our team of educators. Uh, this is uh, many, of the, uh, many of the staff of the education department. And uh, you see one of our members holding a horseshoe crab there. 
A lot of people don't know that horseshoe crab blood, which is blue, by the way, um, is key to development of vaccines. Uh, horseshoe crab blood has a substance that's exquisitely sensitive to toxins. And so virtually every vaccine for the last few decades um, has a sample tested uh, with horseshoe crab blood or with the substance distilled from horseshoe crab blood before it's injected into humans. Um, so there are a lot of uh, STEM implications to what we do. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you to make the challenge between what you do on the boat, what you do on the shore with, um, you know, some of the issues that we see on today's, in today's headlines about how uh, you might not think that a kid going to uh, an aquarium uh, in seventh or eighth grade may ultimately have a relation to, um, you know, to today's toughest challenges. But, uh, you know, but I think you just illustrated that well. Well, and also, you know, perhaps the most important thing that our future citizens are going to do is that they're going to be voters. And uh, we think it's very important that they be able to make informed decisions that are based on, on science uh, as they consider um, their participation in civil society. So um, I want to say, uh, and let's, we'll come to this at the end, but we're getting a number of questions. Uh, we've got a number of uh, educators on the line. We've got um, a number from local schools and local foundations uh, focused on STEM. Um, a lot of questions and interest, Tom, in bringing kids once we're open up to the aquarium or having the traveling teacher program come to their schools, uh, whether the vessel uh, can uh, can come across Long Island Sound, how uh, different school groups might participate in the vessel. So let's reserve some time at the end of this to come back and uh, for you to um, give folks on the call a sense of how we can connect either in the immediate future or uh, in the longer term when we return to some sense of normalcy. Absolutely, that would be great. So we'll, we'll come back to that. But I want to I wanna pivot now. Um, so that's a great overview of what we have to offer, why it's so important. Let's turn to, um, you know, the world kind of falling uh, through the floor uh, all of about six weeks ago. Um, school groups were among the first to cancel, even before we closed, even while we still had visitors in. Tom, your team with was getting cancellations from different schools. So did you have any inkling of what was going to happen or did you just feel that there were a handful of schools being overly cautious and making decisions? Well, you know, um, I, I think we could see the landscape changing. Um, I don't think anyone was able to predict where we would end up with full school closures across the country. Um, it happened very, very quickly. Um, but uh, as you said, we started to see some uh, cancellations from schools that were going to uh, visit us on field trips. And I mentioned that we do send teachers to um, schools as part of our traveling teacher program. So we rescheduled some uh, classes uh, so that we would be going to visit them. Uh, but very, very quickly, within about a day, we started hearing that schools were not allowing outsiders into the schools. Um, and then the following day, schools were canceled. So this, this, this all changed within, literally within about 48 hours. Uh, so, um, so I want to give everybody on, um, on the webinar a sense of how rapidly we made our decisions and then what you did, Tom, to stand up a completely new paradigm for your educational programs. But before we go there, um, going back to um, the discussion on STEM, I, I was debating whether to ask because it's a long, um, it's a long discussion in, uh, in the field on its own, but we do have a question on it. And it's uh, to mention a little bit about STEAM versus STEM and how the how you add arts in there to change the acronym and change the dynamics. So if you could say a word on that, that'd be, that'd be great. And in fact, uh, the particular question is, um, you know, what do you do with students who are visual learners as opposed to uh, more analytical? And um, do we, in fact, offer any programs on the arts rather than on the uh, science or, educate or the uh, engineering side? 
biological illustrations was one of the examples that that was given? That's a, a great question. Um, uh, certainly, um, in recent years, the word, the, the term STEAM has gained currency, uh, including the arts in STEM. Um, it's a long conversation, but I think there are valid arguments uh, in favor of maintaining STEM as a, as a term uh, and valid arguments in terms of adding arts and making it into STEAM. Um, but in terms of what we offer, um, all of our programs are very hands-on. They involve a lot of different learning modes. And they really, more than anything, leverage our live animals and our content. And one of the questions we regularly ask ourselves is, is this program or activity something that we should be doing? And when I say we should be doing, what I mean is, are we, are we using our live animals, our animal knowledge, um, our ability to interpret and engage people with animals um, and the environment um, in the service of this program? And often, if we think it's a program that could be done at a museum or uh, any other sort of institution, we might say, you know, we don't need to be doing that. Um, let's do some things that leverage um, our live animal collection, our live animal knowledge, and our commitment to um, habitats and wildlife. And yes, uh, uh, in our shark safari program, which we're doing online now, um, it involves drawing. Um, we've had marine a animal illustration programs at the aquarium. Um, literacy is very important in our programs. So um, we're doing all sorts of things. We have a camp session that focus on arts and focuses on arts and crafts. Um, so uh, yes, we are very much, uh, although we do talk about STEM, uh, we are very much advocates of a holistic education that involves all sorts of learning types. Well, thanks, and, and I want to, um, I want to riff off of that general, um, that general point, Tom, to say that for me, um, this is also a major priority and, and I am, um, you know, even though we're closed, even though with the aquarium and uh, and the team uh, are dealing with the immediate challenges at hand in terms of revenues um, and programs, uh, we are still thinking of what our future exhibits will be in the summer, the fall, even next spring. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on, as many of you may know, down at the aquarium. But I will say one of the exhibits that most excites me is going to be on sea slugs, nudibranchs. And we're going to do this uh, sometime in the winter, next, uh, next spring, and, but it's going to be a completely integrated exhibit, not just with um, live animals um, and, uh, and tanks to show off uh, those critters, but it will also be sculpture and artwork and images. And we are building out an entire program that will far transcend uh, the living animals that, that people typically associate with aquariums. I'm, I'm really excited by that. Because again, it, it's another way to show how the ocean, how the natural world connects to, um, to us in so many different ways beyond just the biodiversity that we work to protect. Um, let me, um, so let me return to where we were when we closed down, what you've stood up since, and go from there. And in the context of that, let me address another question that came up in terms of whether the virus how, how dealing with COVID-19 has changed the aquarium and whether it's negative or positive. And, and I think as we talk over the next 20, uh, well, we've got about 15 minutes left, Tom. Um, so as we talk over the next 15 minutes, I think you're gonna hear both positive and negative elements. The negative, of course, being the financial constraints, the loss of revenue, the loss of visitors, the loss of um, staff temporarily, um, which has made things very difficult, very challenging. Um, but at the same time, what you are about to hear in terms of how Tom and his team have moved literally overnight to stand up a completely new way of engaging, a completely new way of educating um, our students and our children really is, is incredibly positive. And I think will far 
um, transcend beyond the immediate situation. So with that, Tom, give us a sense of what you stood up, how quickly you did it, how diverse the offerings are, and where we are today. Sure. Well, um, we, uh, I reached out to the STEM director of Norwalk Public Schools um, literally on Friday, I think it was March 13th, which was the day we were closed and Norwalk Public Schools was closed. Uh, actually, I think I reached out the day before. We had our first conference call that day. And yeah, well, well, just to just to interrupt. So um, I think uh, for for the audience, you know, we made the decision on um, March twelfth to close. We were the second aquarium in the country um, after Seattle, um, and uh, by the time our press release went out at night, we were among the fourth uh, aquarium in the country to close. And I called Mayor Reeling of Norwalk and um, and uh, Majority Leader Senator Bob Duff to let them know. And the mayor said he was closing down Norwalk Public Schools. And um, on that very call, we agreed that we would partner on, on distance learning and education. And you know, and you ran with that, Tom, within, within uh, two hours, I think. Yeah, and um, so we started meeting with uh, Tina Henkel and, uh, uh, start, and Ralph Valenzizi, who's the chief technology officer at Norwalk Public Schools. And it was immediately, um, uh, uh, you know, apparent to me that this was going to be an unprecedented challenge. In addition to my time at the Bronx Zoo, I also spent some time working at the New York City Department of Education and McGraw Hill on a couple of technology-based education programs, and saw how difficult it is to implement new technologies in the schools. Um, even with months or years of advance notice. The idea that literally within days or a week, students and teachers were moving all of their instruction online was really, I think, one of the probably greatest challenges uh, that, that our nation has ever faced. I mean, it, the, the learning curve is just incredible. So we knew that um, we could help and we started talking about how we could take um, our content and our programs uh, to the virtual world online in the service of teachers and students. Um, I gathered here a couple of, a uh, few, few headlines to emphasize the challenges. Um, you know, from all over the country, distance learning poses challenges, teachers and parents navigating challenges, um, teachers facing a steep learning curve, um, exhausted and grieving teaching during the coronavirus crisis. Um, if there's any silver lining here, one of them might be that I think suddenly a lot of people who didn't before are appreciating the job that teachers do because having their children home and having to participate in their formal education uh, has been a challenge to a lot of parents. Um, and of course, um, there's a lot of discussion in the education world about summer learning loss, and there has been for years, that over the summer, um, students take a step back, and a lot of communities, including Norwalk through uh, Norwalk Acts, uh, which is a great partnership, has been combating summer learning loss in recent years. Well, now we're talking about a summer that's essentially three times as long, at least and the potential damage is substantial. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to help address that. And the challenge with distance learning is more than just technology. It's also about content and instruction. And that's where we knew that we could make a difference and Norwalk Public Schools was very excited about our ability to work in partnership with them to create lessons online and associated materials that teachers could use uh, as to assign as homework, um, that they could sign their students up for as part of their school day. And uh, uh, we did, um, I think we have, oh, and you know, as I said before, animals engage and motivate people of all ages. And so we started leveraging our content, um, leveraging our instructors and their abilities um, and all of our resources to develop online programs. 
that would uh, essentially mirror a lot of the things we do in the classroom and in the aquarium using virtual tools. Uh, here's the timeline. We engaged with the schools on March 13th. Uh, we spent a week on uh, program development, uh, working very, very hard, uh, testing online platforms. We did program demonstrations for Norwalk Public School teachers the week of March 25th and 26th. And on March 30th, we rolled out a whole slate of offerings both for schools um, and for the public. Um, our first client was Norwalk Public Schools, but these are open to, um, to the public and to schools around the country and around the world. And Tom, give me a sense. Um, so, you know, you're standing up two completely different tracks, right? You've got one dedicated for families and kids at home, and then you've got another dedicated um, to teachers uh, trying to incorporate uh, more formal programming into their classrooms to the extent they're bringing them online. Give us a sense of, um, you know, we're looking at the roster programs you've got right now, but give us a sense as you talk through these, um, the difference between what's offered for families and what's offered for teachers and kids, students. Sure, you see here our, uh, our pre-K through uh, high school um, roster of programs focusing <clears throat> on uh, everything from the adaptations of sharks and water pollution to climate change and citizen science and uh, uh, careers through Meet the Captain. Um, in truth, uh, we developed all of these for schools, and we thought, you know, uh, parents uh, are looking for uh, productive things for their students to be doing. Let's make these available to the public and see if people are interested. Well, the first night we made them available, we had more than 150 registrations for the public versions of these programs. So the first couple of weeks, we were doing the same thing for the public that we were doing for schools. These are all live instructor-led programs in which students can interact through a chat box. They can raise their hands and we can call on them and they can speak in their own voices. Um, since that first week, we've been tailoring new programs to uh, the public as well as the schools. So we have different versions of a lot of these programs and some different programs as well. Um, our most recent uh, program for the public is uh, all about SEALs, which has been very popular. And uh, we're rolling out uh, a public version of your coast and climate change for the first time next week. Um, all right, and Tom, let me just say, before you launch into okay. the next couple of slides, actually putting a map up would be great. Okay. Let me just say we've got, uh, we've got about uh, five minutes to go before we need to wrap up. Uh, but one of the questions that just came in is whether these programs are available outside of our immediate vicinity of Norwalk. And so um, to give sense, uh, you know, to give folks a sense of who you're reaching now that we're no longer beholden to I-95 traffic <laughs> patterns, uh, you know, these next couple of slides uh, will we'll, uh, answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. It's been really exciting. You know, in our normal programs within the aquarium and our traveling teacher programs, we range uh, down to New York City, up to New Haven, up to Waterbury. So it's very much a New York uh, and Connecticut um, uh, clientele. Uh, we quickly saw when we put these online that people all over started registering. Um, we had within about uh, 10 days, we had registrants from 14 states. Um, and this is where we are today. We have had public and school program registrants from 26 states as well as Canada and the UK. And um, we uh, have programs with school classes next week in Florida and in California and in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, and we also um, have, uh, here's just a quick example, um, a teacher in South Carolina um, informed her parents about um, our shark safari program this afternoon. 
And so we've had a huge number of registrants from South Carolina. So it's been very exciting. Incidentally, our new programs, public programs for next week, uh, our new roster uh, is just going online as we speak. A lot of our programs have been sold out. So if you go to our website as soon as we're done, uh, you'll be able to register for the programs we've just listed for next week. Now, Tom, as you go to the next slide, um, we've got a couple questions that are not quite related to uh, education, but go to what we offer at the aquarium. Uh, some questions that Barrett, actually, Barrett Christie, our director of animal husbandry, answered last week. Um, but for those who are on the call and asking the question uh, now for this webinar, what do sharks eat? They <laughs> eat, um, they eat capelin and herring. Uh, both of those are small forage fish that are at the bottom of the food chain in the ocean. Um, and as I learned from Barrett, one is fatty, one is lean. And just like a uh, human diet, um, uh, animals, sharks as top predators need both fatty and, um, and lean uh, food. Um, we only feed them about three times a week. Uh, they, as cold-blooded animals, they do not need to eat a lot like we do. Um, but that's what they eat. And then the other question was, can sharks eat cookies as snacks? And I think many of us know, uh, as we've learned over the years, that flour in particular is really one of the worst things that um, we can give animals, whether it's ducks in the pond or geese um, or birds. Uh, you know, we no longer throw flour um, or breadcrumbs out or um, rice uh, for weddings because flour and grains like that are really bad, in fact, deadly for a lot of animals. And um, so sharks do not eat cookies. We keep them to a herring and capelin diet and, um, you know, and it serves them just well. Uh, with that, Tom, we got a couple minutes to wrap up. So, uh, you know, lead us through these last couple of stats. I know you want to do a couple of deep dives, but I think maybe if you do just one, we could wrap up with a couple of questions and how folks uh, can engage with us going forward. And, um, you know, and then we'll adjourn until next week. Yeah, great. We've, uh, you know, we have more than 80 school programs that have been booked, as I mentioned, uh, all around the country. So I see somebody asked, are they available to districts outside of Norwalk? Absolutely. We're working with districts everywhere. Uh, we've had more than 2,000 individuals in our public programs, and we've had just some, some wonderful comments and repeat registrants. And I should mention that all of our public programs are free. We ask for a suggested donation so that we can continue to support this work, uh, but there is no fee for our uh, public programs. Um, yeah, I was gonna dive uh, just a little bit uh, quickly into our shark safari program for grades one and two, just to give people a sense of what we do. We focus on shark adaptations especially shark teeth. We have our uh, participants help us to identify what different teeth are used for and how they're designed to eat different prey. We focus on a couple of different sharks, mako sharks and zebra sharks. And then we have the opportunity to access a camera in our open ocean tank so our participants can observe our sand tiger sharks and share with us their observations of their adaptations, how they move, um, their sensory organs. So it's a, it's a really engaging um, program. And, uh, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there so we can take some more questions before we finish. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, I think uh, just to close, um, let's return to uh, how folks might reach out to you. You mentioned the website. Um, I think that's probably the best uh, source for information. But, um, you know, questions on how uh, some of the educators on the call can bring their classes to us or how we might go to them. And uh, just some uh, final thoughts before I close us out. Sure. Well, uh, go to our website, um, look under experience, and you will see uh, two pages. One is virtual programs for families. Those are our public programs that you can register for individually. 
and then we have a, a page on distance learning programs for schools. So uh, head over there. Again, our public programs, a lot of them have been selling out. So um, as, as I said, we just posted next week's program. So uh, if you go over there uh, sometime today or tomorrow, you should have no problem. All right, well, thanks so much. So in closing, let me just say thank you all for the time on this call. Thank you all for those of you who are members uh, for your support, for those of you who are donors or can be donors. Thank you either uh, for your contribution or in advance for the contribution you can make. This is a particularly tough time for the aquarium. Uh, you know, 85% of uh, our revenues come from visitors and, uh, and folks who come and enjoy us on site when we're open. And we don't have that available right now. Um, so we are relying heavily on contributions, on philanthropic efforts. And so it's more important than ever that we get support from, uh, from folks who know us, folks who appreciate the work we're doing. And as you've heard from Tom over the last 45 minutes, um, you know, it's been, it's been a labor of love and inspiration to stand up the kind of programming in, um, as quickly and as innovatively as we have. And this is only a part of what you could find for the aquarium online. Um, we're doing um, daily Facebook uh, sessions, question and answer sessions. We've got posts uh, throughout the day on all the social media platforms. So plenty of ways for you to engage with us uh, while we are physically closed to everyone. Um, we will hold another uh, webinar next week, uh, Thursday at 12. Stay tuned for details on that. And in the meantime, again, thank you for all of the support that you give us. Thank you for your interest and your attention. We really appreciate being such a such an important part of um, your lives and uh, the communities in Fairfield County and the broader area. And now, as Tom said, uh, nationally. Um, so stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay optimistic, stay in good spirits. And um, we hope to see you at the Maritime Aquarium soon and certainly online next week. Thank you all. Take care, everybody. <laughs>